Case number two is of a 78-year-old woman who presented with a mass in the palate while she was vocalizing. And uh, imaging actually demonstrated quite a large mass. As you can see here, it extends into the base of the maxillary sinus. The slide you had to look at is a single biopsy, and you can tell that it obviously is not the entire lesion. There is surface ulceration over here, and you can tell that there's quite a remarkably proliferative appearance uh, to the tumor. Let's go and look at it uh, first starting off here in the upper portion. Uh, what is interesting is again the surface ulceration and you can see multiple nodules of tumor but even at this very intermediate power you can tell that there are multiple areas where there is lymphovascular invasion present helping to confirm that already you're dealing with a malignancy. Going to higher power you can tell that there is a fenestrated appearance to it with multiple large cystic spaces filled with a uh, secretory type material. In other areas, there is more of a collagenized stromal component present within it, but still an easily identified somewhat uh, cribriform architecture with other areas giving small projections into the lumen in a somewhat glomeruloid type appearance. Multiple areas here with papillary projections into the lumen with a uh, overall architecture showing a punched out appearance or somewhat cribriform pattern. Areas of central comedonecrosis are easily identified in this tumor. Papillary architecture is noted with nuclei that are reminiscent of papillary thyroid carcinoma. I created a word cloud in the shape of an Erlenmeyer flask to spin up the diagnoses a little bit. Let's talk about them. The findings in this case bring up the differential diagnostic consideration of the polymorphous adenocarcinoma category, which is a tumor that shows quite a bit of diversity, although cytologic uniformity, and generally has a very low metastatic potential. The tumor does arise um, primarily in minor salivary glands, and I think this is the one of the features to highlight in this case, with most of the patients um, slightly older at initial presentation with females affected more often than males. The palate is by far and away the most frequently location for this tumor, but other areas at the base of the tongue, buccal mucosa and retromolar areas are also frequently noted. You will see that there is an excellent overall 96% uh, tenure survival. I'm going to first discuss the polymorphous adenocarcinoma low-grade category. All of us used to call this PLGA or polymorphous low-grade adenocarcinoma, and this is the first category that I would like to discuss. It is by far and away the second most common of the intraoral lesions, uh, usually presenting as a mass of about two centimeters in size and very close to the surface that creates this roughened or corrugated fold type appearance. Here you can see the corrugations that are um, easily identified as the serial rows. And this feature is actually quite characteristic and identified in the tumor uh, by the clinician in order to be able to get an accurate diagnosis. The low-grade category usually has an intact surface epithelium with this very swirled or eye of the storm type appearance, creating a targetoid area that is usually around a central nerve. It will invade out into the adjacent fat incarcerate the area of minor salivary glands with this generally slate gray type mixoid material. So let's look at each of those features. Here you can see that there is an intact surface epithelium over here. Um, there is kind of a world or swirling type appearance to this particular lesion. So everyone always talks about a hurricane and I cannot resist doing this because of course this is hurricane luster. And if you look at it, you can see that there is a whirling and swirling. This is identical to what one sees in the tumor as it develops with this swirled type appearance around a central nidus. And that nidus is actually the area of cranial invasion, which can be easily identified with an S100 immunohistochemistry stain as highlighted in this example. The tumor will infiltrate out into the adjacent fat. And so you can see lots of neoplastic cells in small groups and islands expanding into the adjacent fat. Incarceration of the minor mucoceros glands can sometimes be a problem as it is interpreted by some to be mucinous differentiation in the tumor. And this is definitely not the case. It is just minor mucoceros glands that are being surrounded or entombed by the neoplastic proliferation. 
The slate gray background material is easily identified here with open vesicular nuclei in a streaming fashion. It is important to note that mitotic figures can be identified as you can see here, and it does not dissuade from the diagnosis, although whenever I see many mitoses, I always worry about the potential of it being in a different tumor category. There are usually a wide variety of patterns, lobular and nested, single cell infiltration, but these very bland cytologic cells with abundant cytoplasm and vesicular open chromatin. So here you will see that there is a targetoid appearance with nerves present in the center, and then entombment of the adjacent minor mucoceros glands. Streaming architecture is usually easily identified with this background myxoid matrix material with multiple different architectural patterns easily detected. Single cell infiltration into um, a fibrotic stroma is also a common finding, although still perineural invasion is usually quite easy to identify. The nuclei generally are isomorphic. In other words, they all appear quite similar one to another very small nucleoli, often on the nuclear membrane, and an open vesicular nuclear chromatin pattern. If one now considers the cribriform adenocarcinoma type, so this used to be called CATS for those who like abbreviations, cribriform adenocarcinoma of tongue and minor mucoceros glands, so CATS-MG if you really want the full abbreviation. But the reason why this has been separated out is it does have a different architectural pattern with a cribriform appearance and actually is the correct diagnosis for this case. Further, more than 50% of the patients will have lymph node metastasis at the time of presentation, and it is for this reason that it does need to be separated from the other tumor category within the polymorphous group. So the cribriform adenocarcinoma is unencapsulated, often invading into the adjacent tissue. Central comedonecrosis will be identified. And then there is a architectural appearance of either cribriforming, microcribriforming, tubular or solid appearance, with clefting creating a glomeruloid appearance and sometimes even having peripheral palisade. The surface is intact here, but I think you can tell that there are multiple areas of a very uh, large tumor as it expands in the stromal component. The surface is intact, but I think even at this power, multiple different areas of papillary architecture and a cribriform appearance are easily identified with areas of central comedonecrosis. Bone invasion can easily be identified because it just expands from the palate into one of the adjacent sinuses. Areas of comedonecrosis are usually quite easily identified in this tumor and should be sought. Multiple different architectural patterns with this fenestrated look and multiple areas of fibrous connective tissue, much more uh, acellular and eosinophilic in its appearance than the more myxoid appearance of the low-grade category. Papillary structures are easily identified and in fact comprise a majority of the tumor in this particular field, although not always necessarily identified in these lesions. Here you can see two architectural patterns with the cribriform architecture on the left-hand side, while a more uh, glomeruloid appearance or solid pattern is noted on the right. The neoplastic cells line up into creating almost a glomeruloid type body separated out from the adjacent fibrous connective tissue stroma. Another example here showing reverse polarization, and so in fact a palisading of the nuclei can easily be identified, usually accentuated around vessels. The fibrous connective tissue um, that separates it into nodules often has a mucinous or myxoid type appearance to it. And then the nuclei are usually very large and overlapping, giving you the appearance of a papillary thyroid carcinoma. Here is that fibrous connective tissue stroma, a bit uh, more fibrotic and uh, almost desmoplastic in this area while in a different area of another tumor showing a bit more of a myxoid appearance and perhaps even a slate gray type architecture. It is not uncommon for the nuclei to have a very open appearance to them. And here you can see a sheet-like distribution of these open nuclei. They are very fine, delicate, even chromatin distribution. And in this case, even a somoma body type appearance is identified. The immunohistochemistry for both of these tumors within the polymorphous adenocarcinoma category is that of a single cell population. So in other words, they all 
stain similarly. And in this case, staining with S100 and one of the keratins is usually identified. It's often a variable reaction with P63, while in this case having an absence with P40. As you know, there is a difference in the overall appearance for the genetics of this tumor, with the low-grade category having hotspot activating mutations in the PRKD1, while that same gene is identified with fusions or rearrangements in the cribriform adenocarcinoma category. S100 stains all of the neoplastic cells, as it is a single cell population, while the P40 only highlights a native duct rather than any of the neoplastic cells, a very characteristic finding for this particular tumor category. So there are a number of things that come into the differential, and I would like to highlight just a few of these briefly, recognizing that hybrid lesions, pleomorphic adenoma, canalicular adenoma, basal uh, cell adenoma, and adenoid cystic carcinoma are the major considerations. Here is a hybrid lesion. I think you can tell that it is, again, giving a very cribriform appearance on low power, but when reviewed on high power, the top portion has a more streaming appearance to it, and this would be considered part of the low-grade uh, category, while the cribriform pattern is seen in the lower portion. Another example showing the streaming that is quite characteristic of the low-grade category, while the cribriform category is identified adjacent to it. So it is possible to have combined tumors in this particular entity. Pleomorphic adenoma can be quite difficult on small biopsies. As you know, especially in minor salivary glands, they are not encapsulated. It does not tend to have a cribriform pattern, however, and of course should not have perineural invasion, and plasmacytoid appearance will also be present. It is obviously a biphasic immunopattern with both basal cell markers as well as epithelial markers positive. If you were just to look at this particular area, I think you can tell that there's even a bit of apocrine differentiation and a bilayered appearance to this pleomorphic adenoma. Another example here with a mixoid background material, creating almost a fenestrated look similar to what can be seen in either of the tumor categories. Recurrent tumors may often go out into the adjacent stroma, and so here it is seen mixed with skeletal muscle and may even be adjacent to uh, nerve. The biphasic pattern with pan-cytokeratin and S100 highlighting the two different populations, while the GFAP highlights very strongly the basal um, component, may help in the differential with this tumor. Canalicular adenoma is, of course, a benign lesion with an interconnecting cords or columnar cells with a ball and um, morula appearance to some of the spaces. Uh, this will also stain with S100 and SOX10 while not reacting with P63 or P40. This is an example of a cribriform adenocarcinoma, and I think you can tell from the pattern here it is quite similar to a mimic of what one actually sees in canalicular adenoma. This is a low power where you can see multiple canalicular spaces, higher power showing a columnar appearance to the neoplastic cells with a ball-like area in the center. And of course, the beading that is so characteristic for this tumor can be seen in this low power. The GFAP will stain the peripheral cells, while the S100 will stain all of the neoplastic cells. And in this case, it is a cytoplasmic P63, a tip off to the fact that you are dealing with a different category. Adenoid cystic, of course, can grow in multiple different patterns as well, and the cribriform pattern is much more common, but it tends to have uh, carrot-shaped or peg-shaped cells with a prominent stromal clefting. This will also give a biphasic immunophenotypic reaction. Here you can see a PLGA giving you a very similar pattern to what can be seen in an adenoid. But here you will notice multiple cribriform appearances with the reduplicated basement membrane type material, infiltration with reduplicated basement membrane, and in fact the stromal clefting, very, very characteristic of this particular ne neoplasm. More stromal clefting with a much more hyperchromatic nuclear appearance. And tubules can often be seen, as noted here, with those little tubular spaces giving a tip off to the underlying diagnosis. The biphasic appearance is quite prominent here, shown with a SOX10 or a smooth muscle actin, but obviously it can be highlighted also with a P40, where you can see that there is a very strong basal layer in this neoplasm. 
To end the take home point is that polymorphous adenocarcinoma has two types, low grade and cribriform. They are made up of a single cell type, even though arranged in multiple architectural patterns, and the biphasic appearance of other tumors within the differential should aid in the distinction between these neoplasms. Wishing you a world of salivary gland pathology.